on the dilemmas of a fish eater. I'm from Assam, a part of India that has this huge river system of the Brahmaputra running through it. This river system also has a vast network of tributaries that feed it. Since Assam is an area of heavy rainfall, it also has numerous ponds and marshy lowlands within it. The point I'm trying to make here is that this is a place where fish abound. The rivers and water bodies teem with fish of numerous varieties. Indeed, every district of Assam is famed for a different variety of fish, of the edible kind, of course. It is no wonder, therefore, that the people of Assam are fish eaters. That actually sounds too mild. It would be more correct to say that we are zealous fish eaters, we are rabid fish eaters, people who pine away if we have to eat two consecutive meals without fish. We are ardent lovers of fish dishes, and that's actually an understatement. Of course, then, it goes without saying that there is this huge culture that has grown around fish and the eating of it. Fish is considered auspicious and is carried along with other things to marriage ceremonies. The birth of a baby boy is celebrated with the distribution of choice cuts of fish to friends and relatives. And certainly the way fish is prepared and cooked by a new bride is a marker of her efficiency and expertise. Every home, every housewife, has a special fish recipe that she unleashes on her guests every time she wants to make an impression. When fish holds a position that is nothing short of iconic in a society such as ours, it is a given then that the eating of it must be full of conventions and rituals. After all, one cannot treat such an icon with disrespect, especially when the housewife has toiled over it for hours in her steamy kitchen, just so that your taste buds can exult in its deliciousness. There are therefore certain ways in which fish is served and eaten. A baby is introduced to fish very early, within the first year, in fact. The mother starts by feeding her bits from her own portion, a little at a time. She mashes up the fish with her fingers, making sure that no bones remain. She adds a little dal, or some of the curry if it's bland, uh, boils it up with a bit of rice, and feeds it to the infant in her lap. It is always eaten very greedily, with much lip smacking by the baby, to denote that she appreciates this new food that she's been given, and would her mother now please make it a point to include it in the daily menu, okay? The thing about babies and small children from fish-eating cultures like ours is that they learn very early how to go about it. No cutlery, of course. Little children with their tiny fingers handle the pieces on their plates or their banana leaves with such an expertise that it's astonishing for those who are looking on from other cultures. Looking at them, you would think that they are having something as smooth as mashed banana or some baby food from a tin, maybe. They separate the bones from the flesh so easily that it amazes everybody who's watching. Sometimes, a small bone may make its way into the child's mouth. It happens to all of us. But the child is quick to feel it there. And this is a small child we are talking about. He locates it with his tongue and takes it out from his mouth, putting it at the edge of his plate or his banana leaf very neatly. The larger the fish, like rohu and bhokwa and catfish, they are easy to debone. But the saying goes, that the tastier the fish, the more small bones it will have. The prized ilis, for instance, or the hilsa, is one such. It is lip-smackingly flavorsome, but horrendously difficult to debone. 
When it is cooked in a mustard sauce and steamed, it is to die for. And yet it takes a long time to separate the tiny but sharp bones from the flesh. In fact, I have some friends who have postponed the eating of Elish till they actually retire. Then they'll have more time. When one has finished eating, there is always a mountain of bones piled up on a side plate. But true fish eaters, like the uh, Assamese and Bengalis, think that the time spent on it is well worth it. For as the saying goes, for the love of a rose, the gardener is the servant to a thousand thorns. Or in this case, for the love of a fish, the connoisseur is a slave to a thousand tiny bones. The British, always an inventive race of people, tried to get around the difficulties of the bones by inventing the smoked hilsa. No doubt it is delicious, but it is not that famed dish, the chochori of Elish in mustard sauce, which is nothing sort of, it's nothing short of ambrosia if it's cooked well. The true fish eater will of course always eat with her hands. This means also that fish must be eaten sitting down for who can eat with one's fingers while standing up? Besides, when one eats with one's hands, the sense of touch is added to the experience. The feel of the soft flesh of the fish under one's fingers, the sensation of the fish in its curry, and the mingling of it with the steamed rice is truly magical. In fact, many fish lovers insist that they cannot get the true taste of the fish unless they eat it with their fingers. Fish eaten with implements, they say, is bland and useless. And in the cultures of the people of Assam, people who eat fish with fork and spoon are looked upon with something like derision. Who is this imposter, they imply? Who is this person who has become so westernized that he has forgotten how to use his fingers in order to eat even something as native to our cuisine as fish. The dilemma arises when one goes out of the region and is eating out at restaurants and in other people's homes. All around, people use cutlery to eat their fish. They cut it up into neat little cubes and pop it into their mouths, keeping their fingers absolutely unsullied, clean. Everything is so proper and everything is so alien. The seafood before the diner is crying out to be touched with the diner's fingers so that the tactile dimension is also evident. But then, when we are away from our own cultures, it is usually a bit daunting to pull up one's sleeves or tuck in the archal of one's sari and plow into the fish with one's fingers. On the other hand, for those fish eaters who have always eaten with their hands, somehow the fish doesn't taste nearly as good if there is cold metal between the fingers and the fish. There is also the dilemma of taking out the small bones that one finds in one's mouth. In our homes, it is not considered at all rude to, to take it out with one's fingers and put it on the side plate, on the side of the plate. Some people have, in fact, made an art of it. They take out the little bone delicately, you know, holding it as though it was a flower. Conversation continues around the dinner table, even as people are doing this. But what does one do when one is using cutlery? You cannot spit it out on the plate or on the spoon. That would be gross. And if one is eating at a buffet, how does one balance plate and fish and the bone in one's mouth to get it out. Additionally, there is the dilemma of what to do when a bone gets stuck in one's throat. It happens. Even to the most adept fish eater, it happens. When eating with one's hands, it is the work of a moment to ball up some plain rice and swallow it without chewing. The rice slides smoothly down taking the bone along with it. It's all very calmly done, and nobody around the table is any the wiser. But how does one ball up rice when one is using cutlery? It has been tried, but it cannot be done. So 
by now the person is coughing and spluttering and he has no option but to use his fingers to ball up the rice. In the meantime, the entire restaurant stares at him, some with compassion, but most people without any compassion and quite angry at, at the spitting, at the coughing and you know, uh, making such a fuss about the bone in the throat. Um, however, it is heartening to see that a beginning is being made in solving this dilemma. It is becoming increasingly common to see people using their fingers in even the most proper places. The relish with which they eat is absolutely delightful. It is also a marker of the confidence of the diners themselves. They are no longer intimidated by the posh surroundings of grand restaurants. They are themselves. They mean to enjoy the meal they have ordered. And since it means that they have to eat with their hands in order to do so, they do it. This kind of eating with the hands is also a marker of a different kind of thing. The cultural context in which it is placed is now becoming less inconsequential. It is gradually acquiring dominance in a post-colonial world. And that is truly a fine solution to the dilemmas of fish eaters in a globalized world. Thank you.